So we'll just give a minute there for Maria to let everyone into the webinar there. Excellent. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the final OC3PR of 2022. I'm sure many of you made purchases on Cyber Monday a few days back, which I suspect has only increased your excitement for today's webinar. We will be discussing early warning systems, including what is feasible now and what the future may bring. It will introduce how monitoring and algorithms can help identify patients early who are at risk hopefully when interventions can either prevent or at least mitigate catastrophic complications. As always, the format of OC3PR provides an opportunity for you, the listener, to submit questions. Please submit them to the individual named Q&A. Our questions will be managed today by Dr. Jennifer Sang, who is a member of the Executive Committee. For those unfamiliar with this webinar series, it's sponsored by Critical Care Services Ontario. Its goals are to address the challenges facing health professionals and administrators caring for critically ill patients. This webinar, along with previous sessions, are available at the CCSO website and their YouTube channel. Our most recent webinar on the pediatric response is available upon request. As before, please do your best to keep yourself muted. We hope you can again fill out the survey at the end of today's webinar as we use this feedback to help plan future events. We are also working to get OC3PR fully accredited for Royal College credits. Of the many lessons COVID has taught us, it's clear that health resources are and likely always will be finite. We cannot bring every patient to an intensive care unit. It is neither feasible nor practical to do that. How then can we improve the safety of our patients who are being cared for outside of a traditional ICU? Part of that answer will involve strategies that help identify patients who are just beginning to deteriorate, hopefully at a time when interventions could prevent or at least mitigate the problems they would develop if nothing else was done. The goal of early warning systems is to do just that, identify at risk patients early and not simply when it's obvious to everyone and anyone that the patient is not doing well how to create such a system and avoid some of the pitfalls they can create are but a few of the goals today of today's webinar. We have with us today two excellent speakers who will begin our discussion on early warning systems. Our first speaker is Dr. Mike Milliton. He is an intensivist and respirologist at William Osler Health System in Toronto. He currently serves as their medical director of quality and patient safety and is the interim chief of the Department of Medicine. Dr. Milliton's clinical interests include quality improvement, knowledge translation, telemedicine, and medical decision making. In 2014, he led a multidisciplinary team in the design and implementation of an early warning system at Osler. Presenting with Mike is Dr. Mohammed Mandani. Dr. Mandani is the Vice President of Data Science and Advanced Analytics at Unity Health Toronto. He is the Director of the University of Toronto's James C. Timurdi Faculty of Medicine Centre for Artificial Intelligence, Research and Education in Medicine. Dr. Mandani's team bridges advanced analytics, including machine learning with clinical and management decision making to improve patient outcome and improve hospital efficiency. He received his Doctor of Pharmacy from the University of Michigan Ann Armour and a Master of Public Health from Harvard University. He is a professor in several faculties, including the Department of Medicine, Pharmacy, and the Institute of Health Policy. He is an adjunct senior scientist at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences and has over 500 publications with numerous awards, including being named among Canada's top 40 under 40 in 2010. Yeah, do the math. I figured it out too. Gentlemen, thank you both for the considerable time and effort that you've put into today's presentation. I'm certainly looking forward to it and the discussion afterwards. I think we're going to be starting with you, Mike, and I'll pass it over to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, David. Um, thanks for the intro. Um, I think 
I speak on behalf of myself and, and I think for Dr. Mundani when I say that we're both really excited uh, to share the next hour uh, with you all and um, and share with you uh, what I think we both think is a really, really exciting, um, well, what was a frontier in, in clinical medicine, but was is uh, we're clearly crossed that frontier and uh, I think very exciting um, exploration going forward for sure. Um, I'm going to just give you the next uh, slide, um, which are your learning objectives. I won't read them out for you, but uh, you, there, there are four, and you um, can always uh, come back to those if, if you like at the end. Just make sure I can... So as, as uh, David mentioned, um, this is about how we recognize and manage the deteriorating patient on the medical ward. Uh, as many of you may may know, um, our, our, our failure collectively to recognize and manage a deteriorating patient um, is, is not new, but increasingly recognized um, both at, like, you know, when we work on the front lines um, in upper echelons of hospital management and, and in you know, by, by senior administrators, uh, as well as uh, hospital insurers um, and, and our own uh, uh, physician in insurance uh, bodies, where, because this is one of the commonest reasons that, um, you know, patients have bad outcomes on the ward. And unfortunately, one of the, a very um, common reason for uh, litigation against uh, hospitals and physicians. Um, it is probably one of the largest uh, patient safety um, issues uh, facing us today, anywhere in the world, not just Ontario, but all, all across uh, the world, wherever inpatient medicine is done. And I'll go through a few of the reasons why that is so. Um, we know these are, as David mentioned, uh, patients who are unrecognized and they're getting worse on the world have bad outcomes. Uh, they comprise uh, about 20-30% of our ICU admissions that are from the ward unplanned. So somebody who's deteriorating unplanned, meaning below the ICU. Once they land in the ICU and we think we, you know, we've intervened and, and maybe saved this patient, unfortunately those patients, all comers, have doubled the mortality rate of patients um, that, that didn't require an unplanned uh, ICU admission. And that, that mortality rate is about as high as, high as 30%. We can, based on uh, now two or three decades of work, we know that we can actually identify these patients um, prior to coming in and, and not a minute before coming in, not two hours, um, up to about two days, uh, certainly 24 hours, but sometimes up to 48 hours before uh, they get sick enough to be seen and assessed and come to the ICU. Uh, we, can, we can actually predict that this is going to happen, but sometimes we need a bit of help with that. So what have we done so far? Um, Ontario, like other jurisdictions around the world, has implemented broadly uh, critical care response teams, which have really, I think, arguably, um, but um, more literature supporting this, changed the face of hospitals and provided a, a, a clear um, extra pillar of safety. Um, they're now part of the woodwork in many large institutions. Um, you know, after um, I think a, a noisy and successful launch in Ontario now about 14 years ago and, and spreading and scaling almost you know, every few years, um, it's, it's almost accepted in many places that you have a CCRT uh, supporting you as a frontline clinician, uh, as a family, as a patient. When the pioneering groups in Australia start to look at you know, whether this intervention was effect in fact effective, they got a little bit of a, uh, a surprise. Um, before I unveil that surprise, maybe you may, may know the result, but you can see here that it's clear that the more calls a uh, rapid response team, what they call MET in Australia gets, the better the outcome for patients. So this is a, a famous dose response curve of rapid response calls versus on the y-axis reduction in, in cardiac arrests on the ward. So the more your, the, the busier your CCRT or MET team is, the better your patients are doing. So then there was this paradox when they actually tested um, the you know how well 
um, your patients do once they're if they're in a hospital with a rapid response team versus if they're in a hospital without one um, didn't really seem to make much of a difference and that was a big surprise um, and I know when I was um, launching our rapid response team at uh, Osler I got a lot of questions from uh, um, the MAC about well you know you know this doesn't work Mike so why are we uh, why are we doing it and, um, when the authors went back the authors of study went back and tried to find out what went wrong they realized that um, the calls to the rapid response team only occurred in about 50 percent of patients who were eligible uh, or or, or uh, I'll say had calling criteria their calling criteria are very similar to the ones we use in Ontario, I'll remind everybody. Um, and they end up being 50% sensitive, but by sensitive, I mean, if everyone had a call made that met criteria, the sensitivity would be higher. Sensitivity in this case is you meet criteria and someone calls CCRT for you or about you. Because a lot of calls weren't being made, for whatever reason, the sensitivity was about only 50%. Only the specificity was excellent, but there was clearly a gap uh, here. So the, the dose of CCRT in this trial was probably too low to show a difference. And why do we underdose CCRT? So, you know, we've got to be diligent in measuring vital signs. We've got to be accurate in those measurements. We've got to integrate a lot of disparate pieces of data and make a judgment about what we think is going to happen to this patient in the future. And then we've got to take action once we've made a judgment. Um, we, we now have a lot of uh, understanding from behavioral science and, and psych behavioral psychologists that we're, we're definitely in, imperfect at that. Um, we're, we're, you know, we're fallible, we're human, and sometimes we'll make mistakes. And sometimes we have difficulty, in fact, integrating a lot of disparate data when we're being pulled in many directions, when we're tired, and when we're stressed. So how do we optimize we have CCRTs in many places. How do we optimize them? How do we make sure they get the patient early enough? So we could simply, one way we could think about doing this is hardwiring um, that, that call. Um, improving the, the afferent arm, meaning the signaling arm to the team or to somebody with that accountability. And that's the rationale for early warning systems, really. Um, how do we make sure that that signal of a deteriorating patient translates into, into action? So early warning systems are systematic, usually computer-assisted scrutiny of a vital sign database, looking for abnormal patterns. Um, I'll say that vital sign database in very simplest form, but now uh, these algorithms are starting to be enriched by, by patient demographics, by lab work, um, by almost anything your, your EMR uh, collects. And as long as it's in the system, um, you know, smart data scientists can uh, start using that data to predict who's going to become unwell. These abnormal patterns are packaged as alerts and communicated back to an accountable care provider. The response there is also needs to be defined, scalable, and patient-focused. I think I missed the next slide. So, you know, sometimes when we started on this journey, we were asked by clinicians, well, you know, I, I can recognize a sick patient, but I don't need a computer to, to help me. I'd argue that we, we kind of over rely on our intuition about uh, who's sick and who's not. We, we do well with it 90% of the time, but we probably fall down about 10% or, or more, especially when we're cognitively overloaded and moving fast. Many of us are both, um, you know, both ward staff physicians daily face high volumes of complex and sick patients. Um, we now, um, with our current HHR crisis, we're seeing more novice um, staff all the time and, and who need coaching and mentoring and take time to even develop that intuition that we all need. Um, and then there's an issue of alarm fatigue. So there are alarms going off constantly on our wards and sometimes adding yet another alarm about an alert about a deteriorating patient may be something that, um, you know, is, you know, we want to make sure that the alarm is meaningful uh, to providers. So it's not something else that they're sort of turning off because um, they, they, they need to get through their day, you know, mentally, mentally and, and, and emotionally intact. So because we're not great at humans at integrating a lot of pieces of information, um, 
and it takes us a lot of time, we can just we can ask a computer to, to do that for us. Essentially run a checklist or an algorithm and tell us if our patient has systemic inflammatory response syndrome, SIRS, uh, which is about 80% of our admissions from the wards have a, with that combination of abnormal vital signs or an altered alteration of le uh, level of consciousness or both. We can design our sensitive our algorithm to be very sensitive, uh, so pick up everybody, but at the cost of specificity or very specific. But you're going, to, of course, if we do that, we're going to miss some some patients. And how we set these characteristics is determined by you know who we choose to give the alert to. So if you're going to give it to the alert to, let's say, the bedside nurse. Uh, or a charge nurse, you may want to set the sensitivity quite high not to miss anybody. If you're also feeding uh, an alert to a CCRT that's covering, perhaps your CCRT nurse and physician are covering an entire hospital, you're going to want to set the, sensitiv the sensitivity lower but the specificity quite high in order that they are not uh, bombarded with non-specific alerts. So these are choices you, you make as, a, as an institution. Um, and, and depending how, how you're set up, but you can certainly, you certainly have that leeway when you're designing the system. The literature uh, to date has been mostly about, you know, my system is better than yours. Uh, our combination or our algorithm is better than yours. We have the better area under the curve, which is sort of the, you know, what everyone likes to publish and ours is, you know, 0.2 better than yours. So ha ha. Um, in the end, most of them um, prior to machine learning, most of them perform about the same. I'm not sure the differences are clinically meaningful. What we found in our experience at Ulcer is, is what matters is matching the alert to the level of accountability and being careful about alarm fatigue. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, I mentioned the literature to date. There is some emerging literature actually looking at outcomes um, in, associated with deploying these systems. Um, we have uh, three uh, larger studies, mostly from the UK and Australia, and you can see from the um, the SBC chart at the bottom right, um, this larger UK study showed some decrease in, in ward mortality as uh, the black line, the heavy line, which is uh, the observations increased. Um, and but the, these 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 decreases were were small and yet significant uh, in these studies. Our, our system, we, we called Aegis, which is the Greek word for shield. We thought we were hopefully protecting our patient. Um, vital signs were taken by a ward caregiver, entered um, into the, uh, or sent from the bedside terminal now into the EMR wirelessly. So that's quite fast. And the EMR is able to uh, decide, does this person meet criteria for a SIRS? Um, do they have CCRT calling criteria? We entered that into the algorithm as well. Uh, and uh, do they have a, a decreased level of consciousness? And then they, that system will send uh, an alert to a team leader's mobile device. Each team leader, a nurse on each ward has a mobile device. And so it's sort of a decentralized process. There's not one person who gets all the alerts in the hospital, that would be too much. But by dividing it uh, by, we realized the system could send alerts from a ward to that ward's matching uh, team leader. So ward A, team leader, uh, any alert from ward A goes to the team leader from ward A, not from ward B. And that, that made it manageable uh, for, uh, you know, it made it a manageable number of alerts per day, about three new alerts per day for a ward of 30, uh, 30, uh, 30 patients. And then the response arm was scalable, anything from increased frequency of vital signs, uh, a review at rounds, an MRP call if it was uh, if the patient looked more sick, all the way to a CCRT call if uh, the alerted if the alert said you know met this these are CCRT criteria have been met, please call CCRT. And sometimes these have been a trigger for goals of care discussions as as well um, as uh, physician or, or ICU evaluation. This is what the alerts uh, look like. So we, we know who the patient uh, is, where they are, and uh, who their physician is, date and timestamp. So we can go back afterwards and make sure our system is, is working um, in, in, uh, in good fashion and not deteriorating. Uh, at our, our 
pilot, um, you can see what happened in the very first month, a manageable number of alerts, mm -hmm. and sort of what, what happened with, with our patients. So anywhere from mostly an increased uh, vital sign monitoring to some needing CCRT consult, some having uh, new antibiotics imaging, both fluid boluses or goals of care discussion. This is a would be a, a typical month on a typical medical ward. Not that, that has not really changed. In our uh, pilots, we were happy to see a decrease in uh, code blues, uh, reduction in unplanned ICU admissions. We estimate about two to four lives saved each month across six wards in the pilot. Um, benefits from nursing in terms of um, situational awareness, knowing what's going on with your ward, um, able to hand over in an even better way to your partner coming on in the evening or evening to morning, saying, you know, patient A had an Aegis alert uh, go off, they might need some closer, um, you know, monitoring night or uh, maybe buddy up the nurses or have a more experienced nurse with this patient, allowing a shared mental model of what's going on in the ward and uh, good um, situational awareness. We expanded this system to the remainder of medical and surgical wards in 2015. And uh, this is our, our code blue rate per thousand admissions uh, to 2019. I didn't include the last couple of years because of our, our I wasn't able to separate the, the COVID uh, related code blues. So uh, I, I've left that out. We can see we had a, a nice reduction um, as a result of our initial uh, pilot and then expansion. And we've managed to sustain that over time. And this is a, a run chart from one, uh, one ward, uh, a high volume, high flux uh, ward with, uh, of course, being cardiology, high burden and high acuity um, of, of patients. And uh, the red line is where we uh, deployed HSR early warning system. And you can see over time, we've managed to uh, decrease the number of uh, code blues and the, the average fell by, by a, about 20-25% uh, on this, on this ward uh, over time. Um, and now just quickly, um, our, our, our system is, is, is fairly brute to use as an old uh, Meditech, uh, you know, almost DOS-based uh, EMR. Um, many hospitals have, have uh, gone to newer and better EMRs. The uh, sepsis model by Epic uh, is turned on, it has been turned on several hospitals for years, was finally evaluated uh, in a study published last year with an AWC, uh, say an AUC of only about 0.63, so maybe not as great as people had thought, um, a very poor positive predictive value, and uh, so a lot of false alarms triggered by, by that system. 18% of all hospitalized patients had an alert generated at some point with very, very low specificity, unfortunately. Um, machine learning algorithms um, are looking, uh, I think, frankly, amazing, and you'll hear more from Dr. Mondani um, in terms of uh, their performance, in terms of both discrimination, sick versus not sick, and calibration. And sometimes we worry about what, what the machine is thinking or doing. Um, so far, it looks like the machines are thinking a little bit like we are, probably better. But um, you can see, for example, respiratory rate, which is a key uh, abnormal respiratory rate, key predictor of uh, patient unwellness or bad outcome, um, is is um, very is weighted fairly heavily in uh, in some machine learning algorithms, which which kind of gives us some face validity as clinicians, I think. And um, this is just a graph of models showing that machine learning models actually have nice um, improved specificity for a given level of sensitivity. So here at a level of 75% sensitivity, the purple line actually gives you um, the fewest uh, false positives, uh, which is what uh, I think staff really value a lot. Just quickly, uh, um, the only RCT we have of a machine learning model in an ICU um, population showing um, implementation of that versus uh, their existing early warning system, a non-machine learning system, uh, showed some nice decrease in length of stay by, by abil its ability to predict sepsis uh, early. I think that was my last slide. And I'll transition over to Dr. Mandan. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to try and keep it brief because I know we want to leave a lot of time for questions. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the place that I come from is Unity Health Toronto. 
which is a composition of St. Joseph's Hospital, St. Michael's Hospital, and Providence Health. I'm going to focus on St. Mike's for the purpose of this uh, discussion. Um, we're a church care teaching hospital in downtown Toronto, established in 1892. We're basically Toronto's inner city hospital. We're one of two adult trauma centers in the greater Toronto area. We have about 500 beds, over 6,000 staff, over 900 physicians, over 1,600 nurses. And approximate annual patient volumes is we have about 80,000 eMERGE visits, over half a million ambulatory visits, and over 25,000 inpatient visits. The reason why I'm telling you these numbers is if you multiply this by about 15 years of historical data, it's quite a bit of data to work with. Uh, in uh, 2019, our uh, CEO had um, declared artificial intelligence, AI, to be a strategic pillar for Unity Health. And I think we're the only um, uh, hospital organization in the country to do that, which means that we actually have a dedicated data science and advanced analytics team, where I have a team of um, close to 30 data scientists. And our whole job is to develop and deploy solutions, many of them using machine learning and artificial intelligence in the clinical practice. Uh, so we have this kind of unique uh, process where we have a very progressive data governance framework that enables our team and access to data in real time to be able to develop and deploy solutions. If we go to the next slide. This is um, based on a patient, an actual patient at St. Mike's from about, I'd say about four or five years ago where uh, we had a 73-year-old retired banker um, with inflamed gallbladder, cholecystitis, where we thought, you know, I mean, it's fairly standard. We see these sorts of patients quite often. Um, shouldn't be too hard to manage. Um, unfortunately, uh, the, the physician was called that evening where the patient had shortness of breath. So the physician obviously ordered chest x-rays in the labs. Vital signs were checked twice overnight. And the physician was called at 8.30 the next morning uh, because of a sudden drop in blood pressure. And the patient deteriorated and unfortunately died. The family was distraught and said we would never left his bedside. So um, if we can click again, the reality is that one in 12 uh, internal medicine patients roughly will die in the hospital. So when we asked what could be done, if we could click, um, we were told, well, you know, you can increase monitoring, Q4, Q6, uh, look for signs of sepsis, initiate antibiotics go to the next one, uh, we could, could have called the critical care response team to give them a heads up on the patient. The next one could have called palliative care if we knew there was nothing we could do about this patient. At least the patient could die a dignified, comfortable death. And of course, the last one, if we click again, is communicate. Now we could have done this if we clicked one more time a lot earlier, but we didn't because we didn't know. And so our challenge was, if we click one more time, can we predict who will die so we can intervene earlier? So we click again, uh, that's what our team did. So we actually developed an early warning system based on machine learning models, where uh, what it does is it predicts in the next 48 hours if a patient is gonna die or go to the ICU. And it's all automated. There are a lot of uh, systems I know that are manual, cumbersome for nurses. You have to put in vitals. Uh, this actually grabs data from the electronic records. And I have to say, with St. Michael's, we have a fairly antiquated system. We were pretty sophisticated at one time, but uh, we do not have a modern EPR yet. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a struggle to get the data that we need, but that's where we have a lot of data engineering to get us there uh, to be able to enable this sort of tool. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about how it works, but it works every hour on the hour. It basically grabs data. It's been trained on about 20,000 patients worth of data. It's learned all sorts of permutations and combinations. And uh, it categorizes patients as low, medium, and high risk. As soon as it reaches a high risk, it pages the medical team. And the medical team has to see the patient uh, within the next two hours. We deployed this in October of 2020. And uh, within a few weeks of us deploying, we had comments like this, and we could click again, that came to us from our attendings. The resident on call overnight received a high risk alert around 11 p.m. She went and reviewed the chart and saw the patient as per the recommended protocol, and he was relatively stable. So maybe this was a false alarm. Approximately two hours later, she received a call from the nurse that the patient was decompensating. As she already knew the patient, she was able to quickly assess at the bedside and get the ICU team involved. The patient went to the ICU, but did not thankfully have a respiratory arrest, which was certainly a risk if the intervention had not been done as quickly. The resident feels that the AI program made a big impact. We also have preliminary data um, uh, looking at our mortality rates. 
we deployed right in the middle of COVID, but despite seeing many, many more COVID patients uh, after the deployment of the algorithm, uh, if we click again, we're, uh, we're seeing about a 15 to 20% reduction in mortality among our high-risk patients. So that's really encouraging to say that maybe all you know, these things actually can save lives, which is uh, really exciting for us. If we go to the next slide. So again, the way it works is uh, it grabs, uh, it has data on demographics, but it grabs labs and vitals. We actually had many different features come in, like we had actually reading nursing notes and doing natural language processing and all that fancy stuff. Uh, we had very complicated models, but what we learned is that the simpler the model is, the easier it is to deploy. So we kept it quite simple and the performance here wasn't so bad with just literally these, these three types of data. If we go to the next one, so it feeds into something called an XGBoost. It's a tree-based machine learning model. Um, and it classifies patients, again, every hour on the hour as low, medium, and high risk. We click again. Something that was really important is how often does it reach high risk and how often do you bother the medical team? When we looked at existing um, uh, early warning systems, we were finding that the vast majority of them will alarm clinicians 10, 20 times a day that's not going to work because our clinicians were very clear. We don't have time to deal with all that. So this solution um, alarms once or twice a day. Um, so it's actually it, the alarm fatigue issue we, we took to heart. Uh, if we click on the next one, what happens then is once the clinicians actually get alarmed, they have an intervention checklist. So to reassess the patient um, and have all sorts of considerations on how they can better manage the care. Um, all of this is automated again, right? So nobody has to do anything manually. If we click again. One of the things that people struggle with, and we struggle with quite a bit, is not the machine learning algorithm, but how the heck do we communicate to our doctors? Because we don't have a, the modern EPR or fancy communication me mechanisms. So we actually have three ways of doing this. One is literally to send out emails. The second is to use our paging system called Spoke. And uh, the third is to put it on an e-sign out tool. Now we actually currently have a, uh, I think a, a reasonably well done operations center where we actually have real time information on all of our patients. And we're embedding now the chart watch status in that operation center. So anyone who wants access to it can have access to it and actually see the status of their patients in terms of risk. Um, the other thing we actually quickly learned is that when we first started deploying, um, our clinicians were very excited because they're the ones who brought us the idea. They wanted this but our nurses were very apprehensive, thinking this is gonna increase our workload. But what we quickly realized is that within a couple of weeks, the nurses were using it for, for allocation of staffing. Because before it was just a lot of guesstimation work around, all right, well, this nurse ends up getting all the high-risk patients and that's not really fair for them. But now they actually allocate uh, no more than two red or high-risk patients to a given nurse. And that's actually kind of received very well from the nursing staff to reduce uh, burnout and stress. So there's more equitable allocation of patients. Uh, something we didn't anticipate, but uh, something that, that uh, ended up happening. We go to the next one. Lots of considerations here. I'm just gonna highlight a few in the interest of time. The first again is around the workflow considerations, right? When somebody comes in and says, you know, accuracy, um, I'm gonna use a very, very basic metric around per model performance. I'm gonna pick accuracy. It's a terrible metric, but I'll just use it. If somebody comes to me and says, my algorithm is 96% accurate, many times I'll say, that's a terrible algorithm because our clinicians have a 98% accuracy rate. But if somebody comes to me and says, my algorithm is 76% accurate, I'll say, that's fantastic because our clinicians have a 62% accuracy rate. So your model performance is not simply a metric of, let's show you how big the AUC is, but it's about relative to what? So what we did as part of our, our model development is we actually went to the floors. And for months, we literally asked our doctors, our nurses, and our residents, do you think this patient's gonna die or go to the ICU? And we had over 3,000 clinician predictions. We compared our 3,000 clinician predictions to other early warning systems like NEWS in the UK, for example. Uh, that's been deployed, I think, at 70 to 80% of the hospitals in the UK. Our clinicians beat NEWS we would never deploy it because it's gonna be of no use. In fact, it's gonna annoy our clinicians because of too many false alarms. That didn't make any sense. But our algorithm was able to beat our clinicians. 
And that's what made our clinicians feel like this is actually going to give me value and not tell me something I already know or send me on a wild goose chase on patients that really I don't need to be spending as much time on. So that was really important. Uh, and that goes to clinical validation. And of course, education. That was really important for us as well. These algorithms are not perfect. They're going to make mistakes. But they should be making fewer mistakes than our clinicians because this is hard stuff. It is really hard to do good prognostication. So with the way we educate folks is that as a clinician, you are ultimately responsible for the patient. If you feel that this patient is high risk and the algorithm says they're not, please consider them high risk, use your intuition and do your explorations and actually manage the patient. If the algorithm says that they're high risk and you don't believe they are, still treat them as high risk. Just be conservative because it's the ones where you say they're low risk and the algorithm says low, low risk, that's fine, that's great. But if either one says they're high risk, give the patient that attention they need. And that was um, a bit of a challenge in terms of education, but uh, I, I think it resonated with people. Privacy and confidentiality, uh, we have, uh, I think now, I would say one of the most, if not the most progressive uh, data governance framework to enable artificial intelligence in our hospital that gives access to the right people, to the right type of data. Because you can imagine building a model saying, well, I can't tell you it's Mr. Jones because you have to have de-identified data. Well, that doesn't do me any good. I need to know it's Mr. Jones who's going to deteriorate. So the right people having right access to the right level of data. Risk and liability, of course, there were conversations around clinicians asking us. So algorithm says they're not going to do well. I think they're okay. They don't, I don't do anything. And the patient doesn't do well. Do I get sued? So of course, lots of consultations around legal opinions and, and uh, liability issues and such. And of course, bias and equity. We did some, some testing around, does our algorithm perform just as well among young versus old, males versus females, sick versus not so sick? Seems to work out really reasonably well. We don't have good data on race. We don't have good data on socioeconomic status and gender education levels. We don't know how well it performs in, so, in those subsegments. But does that mean we don't deploy? I would argue that's not the case. I think we have to actually look at uh, uh, weigh pros and cons. So lots of considerations here. Then maybe the last one. Um, oh, I think that's it. Uh, so uh, I think I'll just summarize by saying that when we actually deploy these algorithms, it's yes, the, the model building is fun and the performance is important, but I would say the change management, the human factors, the workflow is really what drives how we develop algorithms. And that comes from our clinical community, not from our computer scientists or the, the technical folks. Uh, that integration between clinical leadership and technical leadership is so critical to get uh, uh, models that perform well. So thank you. Gentlemen, thank you both. Um, I got several questions and um, uh, I suspect Jennifer has some as well. So, um, so I don't even know where to, to begin, um, but Mike, uh, your made at home kind of solution, which I, I don't say that disparaging because uh, we have Epic and I'll be honest, I don't, we don't respond on it. I, I use it as a check and a balance to make sure I've, I've, I've done, you know, due diligence, which is what I think you were alluding to there, Muhammad, that, uh, you know, don't ignore it, but um, don't let it rule you, um, so to speak there. I guess I'm curious about the cost, the time to, to program it. Um, how, how were you able to achieve that, Mike? Yeah, um, we, were, we were fortunate. The, um, so we, um, and, I, and I apologize, I, I didn't, uh, introduce our our hospital uh, well enough I, th I think so William Moser is a, a large community hospital uh, multi-site hospital in Northwest GTA um, we have between two now three sites I think about uh, close to 200,000 emergency visits a year um, and about a thousand beds um, so we we use uh, Meditech and our um, you know, the programming for this was fairly simple, um, you know, just asking Meditech to, you know, give the setting cut points for, um, you know, vital sign normal or abnormal. Uh, for SERS, for example, it had to look at four different um, uh, uh, vital sign pieces or three different vital signs and, and, a, and a white blood cell count, which Meditech in, in fact can do. Um, and our IT department, which, uh, you know, doesn't have any specialization 
in terms of um, uh, machine learning, certainly, um, or even using a logistic regression machine, um, or logistic regression um, system, was able to program this with ease. Um, and then we were we were fortunate in that the output, meaning um, the alert, was also doable through that EMR uh, through another third party software, which was just sort of, I think, sitting there. And I know some of my IT people are, are watching and I hope they don't kill me, but uh, I don't know enough about the technical portion. But we were fortunate in that uh, it could kick out an alert um, to to anybody or to you know to a phone number to a wireless device with with ease i know that's not a situation with every ev everywhere um but it was not a, a big technical hurdle at all so we were we were just a, a fortunate and we had a, a, a very uh, committed team who really wanted to make this succeed so i think a, a simple or homegrown system is is doable for most um it it, it Without some of the software to help you with the alerts, I think there is some uh, upfront cost because we had that kind of, you know, we, I, I sort of uh, dumbly walked into it and there it was. So it didn't end up costing the hospital anything beyond the cost of a few iPhones. Uh, for other places which need the alerting the software, um, it's somewhere around 40 grand, I think, to, to, to buy that. So we looked into expanding to another hospital. Um, so that that's about the cost, about forty thousand dollars, and um, the programming can be done by a, a community hospital IT department. So not not too complicated, uh, not exorbitant, not millions of dollars. I think is is the take home. And I actually wonder if other um, Meditech sites could just you know borrow it, if if anything, um, and and certainly some ideas. One of the questions for perhaps both of you that kind of blended in is, is the sensitivity and the specificity and how hard do you think it would be to dial it up, dial it down? And, and, and the reason I'm suggesting that I'm wondering sometimes when hospitals are over capacity in, in the staffing ratios are less than ideal, is there value, you know, actually dialing the sensitivity so it's it, it um, you'll get more calls recognizing that the eyes on and it, is that realistic or am I being over simplistic in, in suggesting that that can be done easily? Maybe I'll, I'll take on the, the Meditech one that I'll ask, I'll ask Muhammad to, to there answer his, his what his system can do. Um, we spent a lot of time in silent testing um, just to to see what kind of uh, signals we were getting and uh, kept looking at our sensitivity specificity and sort of pegged it as, again, because of the way we were sending the alerts in a decentralized manner, we said, okay, let's dial up the sensitivity. Our, 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 our positive predictive value of Agus uh, at Ulcer is around 16, 17%. So, but it's on purpose like that. We aim for higher sensitivity because we knew that as long as we were sending alerts to a lot of different people during the day, it was manageable on a, on a ward level. So we were okay with that. Um, we are, we do not send alerts to the rapid response team because that would be clearly overwhelming. Uh, we had tried to, as you say, actually scale down the sensitivity up this specificity so we could involve CCRT, but we never found unfortunately a good cut point. And I think that's a limitation of our system actually. It just, it's it's crude. It's bulky. We use you know ten different data points instead of you know twenty or thirty or and I think that's where a machine learning algorithm clearly shows its chops. Like it shows its advantages um, in in that area. That's great, Mohammed. Your thoughts on it? Yeah, I think um, absolutely. I think you could actually play with those parameters. Um, just to give you a sense in terms of our model, uh, our sensitivity, uh, the way we've set it in terms of what's acceptable to our clinicians is um, mid to high 40s. Um, so it captures almost half of the patients, but um, our positive predictive value is over 30%. So it's about one in three um, uh, will actually get it right. And the other two, maybe a false alarm. 
uh, it can go as high as depending on on um, uh, the unit and, and where we deploy as high as 40% uh, percent or so. So we do actually try to balance both being reasonably acceptable. What I worry about is that when our clinicians kind of get in a nice kind of, oh, this is how it works, this is what I expect. If we start fiddling around with the parameters, they may start noticing and I'm getting a lot more alarms and they're really bothersome. And then they start losing trust in the algorithm. So we're a bit hesitant to kind of play around with those, um, but you know, maybe, maybe we should. Um, and we can revisit with our clinicians once uh, things get a bit more stable at the hospital with respect to resourcing. Yeah, well, I'm thinking not necessarily, necessarily it always has to be the physician or a CCRT response. Maybe I'm thinking the nurse um, assigned to the patient may get a, an earlier response or a respiratory therapist may get a response. Just, you know, I think in this this day when everyone is overwhelmed you don't want to overwhelm them but if it's more directed um you know i know we try to do hourly nursing but you wonder whether this could complement that and, and adjust it uh, accordingly um the last question i have for you before i go to to jennifer will be uh, um in terms of right now it's predicting death in icu is there any role of flipping it like predicting who could be safely discharged or transferred sooner, or uh, um, I, I like the idea of affecting acuity staffing. Um, I, I, or am I stealing your thunder? Or is this a future publication out there? Is there that possibility to to reverse? Yeah, actually, maybe I can comment. Uh, so, uh, and we'll head over to Dr. Millison as well. So it's. It's funny you should say that, and actually that is a bit of stealing of the thunder because um, when we started talking with other folks, um, our, our system categorizes patients as red, yellow, and green. And it's interesting how some other organizations said, that's great that you're looking at the reds. I wanna look at the greens because if I know the patient's clinically stable, now there's all sorts of other social factors and stuff too, that it's, it's harder to get into without going into text notes and understanding social factors and all that sort of stuff. But in terms of getting at clinical stability, yeah, we actually now are, have a kind of separate but very related solution that leverages the core risk um, assessment focused on actually discharge planning. So we're expecting in the next couple of months actually to launch a discharge planning solution that focuses on clinical readiness. Yeah, I, 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 we had uh, the same questions, which are excellent. Exactly, like tell me about the the low risk patients. So we we had reconfigured it to look at sc a score, and, and for example, news, which Dr. Mundani referred to in his his portion of the talk, uh, very um, sort of which is all over the UK and parts of Australia, is a multi parameter system which scores the patients. So the worse your vital signs are. The, the higher your score, the more stable they are, the lower your score. And so we, we tried to mimic that. Um, we ran into some of the difficulty that, that Dr. Mamdani mentioned in terms of um, workflow, convincing clinicians. Um, it became a bit of a, it, it, it became a bit of a, a hill that I, I, we felt we were running up solo on, you know, carrying the spear and we we, we ran back down the hill on that one, but something we, we continue to think about for sure, because I think there's a, a huge potential there. And I think one thing I'll also add to on that note is, you're right, you know, I mean, our internists, um, and I, I hope I don't offend anybody, they're not interested in discharge planning, but our discharge planners and our caseworkers and, and those sorts of folks very much are. And so it was a different shift in terms of an audience that we had to, to cater to to develop now our or it's it's a terrible name a discharge planning solution uh, but it's really about clinical readiness they're the targets not the interns well i, I won't uh, sidetrack us anymore on that tangent but uh, maybe we'll take that offline um i'm going to go to jennifer now and again i would encourage individuals if they have questions to send it to q a so so jennifer i'll pass it over to you for some questions for our speakers Chris. Thank you um, for the great talk, uh, Dr. Mangdani and Dr. Militan. I have a question from Will Handara. Um, he asked that, um, to, this is a question to Dr. Mangdani. 
any thoughts on the external validity of the models like your model that were developed? Because uh, right now you have one specific institution's data. So is there a possibility to do a validation step in other hospitals uh, and, and, and see whether it's worthwhile to scale your program uh, across the province? Yeah, it's uh, funny you should mention that. <laughs> um, we will be deploying um, uh, in the new year at uh, our St. Joe sites, but we're already um, uh, in discussions with, actually not even discussions, have progressed much further than that. We're actually getting into data engineering issues now with access to data to community hospitals um, to see how the algorithm performs there. Now our approach is, is is a bit conservative, and I, I think uh, justifiably that we won't just simply deploy our algorithm as is. We're going to be getting data, retraining our algorithm on their specific data to make sure that it's actually understanding their patients, uh, and then having a sole process around deployment. Along that line, how how do how does a hospital reach out to you? Say that they were interested in being a site for validation, how, how could we, how could the site make it possible in terms of what infrastructure they need to have? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we are a bit limited because you can imagine my CEO will say, hey, you know, you should be doing work for our hospital. <laughs> and, uh, where does the funding come from to support other hospitals? I mean, I would love to see this in as many hospitals as possible. So um, I think we're going to be quite limited in terms of how many hospitals we we do work with, I mean, just because of capacity issues. But um, if people are interested in learning more about how we're doing, we're happy to talk with them and seeing what what could be done technically at their hospital. Thank you. Uh, there's another question from uh, Lean Healy. Um, her question was, how do you handle repeat of alerting at Sing Mice, for example, every hour? Uh, how do does the system um, is it able to determine whether the patient is stable or the patient is deteriorating using your system? Yeah, a great question, and I'll ask uh, Dr. Melton to jump in as well in terms of how they're handling it. But uh, we spent quite a bit of time on on um, alarming methods and approaches, so. Um, for example, you know, you could have a red patient go off every hour on the hour and be incredibly annoying to clinicians, but we have silencing rules that say that once a patient is red, it's flagged as red in their in emails and in your e-sign out tool, but we will not alarm you again for an X period amount of time so that you're not bothered. Um, so it, it's rules like that that become really important from a usability perspective. Um, and then, of course, if uh, let's say a certain amount of time passes, uh, let's say a patient goes from red, then all of a sudden they go to yellow, and then they go to green and right up to red, depending on the time that it takes for them to go through that cycle, if it happens within a 12 hour period, we're still not going to alarm you. But what we also do is the algorithm knows that the patient is changing from red to orange to green, but it's going to keep them at red just to be safe. So the physician knows, you know what, something happened like recently, we don't change it right away. And uh, there's all sorts of, you can imagine all the permutations and combinations. We spent months going through all of them and figuring out what are the rules that'll work best. Thank you. I have one more question from the audience. Stephen Skitch asked, uh, I think this might be uh, geared toward uh, Dr. Milliton. Um, he stated that one of the challenges they have at a community site is overburdening of CCLT calls, uh, especially calls from um, cases where they might not have otherwise met criteria. He asked whether there's any solution to that using your early warning system or any other ideas that could sort of, because you know part of the concern is with this early warning system and whatnot it might further increase workload of the, the rapid response team. So I want to see what your thoughts are. Yeah, um, so so we um, we definitely integrated calling criteria into the algorithm so that, um, you know, the message coming back to the charge nurse were, was, now remember the charge nurse is not at the bedside. So the charge nurse getting a, 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 you know, uh, an alert saying your patient met calling criteria. 
um, you know, consider calling CCRT. And, you know, with any alert, they'll go back to the bedside with, with the bedside nurse, um, validate those vital signs, you know, sometimes uh, vital signs get entered incorrectly. They'll validate them, they'll look at the patient, they'll make a decision. Um, patients who were um, on, a, on a palliative care uh, plan or trajectory, we, we actually remove them from the patient list uh, of alerts. Um, that cuts down on some repeats uh, for sure. It cuts down on some, uh, improves the specificity somewhat. Um, we actually, I don't think we saw an increase in CCRT uh, activation since uh, since deployment over and above the uh, what we expected with increasing bed numbers, et cetera. Uh, and I'm not speaking of with, with COVID for, for sure. We saw a spike that was clearly COVID related. So we didn't have that experience where we were getting uh, calls about um, patients who didn't meet criteria. I think if anything, uh, the specificity of the calls to CCRT probably improved some, somewhat. Um, so we, we didn't we didn't find that. And I think just to, because of the way we, we structure things, they are, you know, while the specificity of the alerts are not great when they, when overall, if you look at this subset that are triggered by CCRT calling criteria, the specificity is, is pretty good, right? Remember, I showed you in my, one of my earlier slides, the, the, in the merit study, their specificity was, I mean, they claim 96%, which seems very, very high to me, but um, is probably quite good. So, you know, SIRS is not very specific, but CCRT calling criteria are actually not too bad. So I think if anything, we, we, we found, um, uh, you know, some, some better better performance and um, certainly not burdening the, the, the team with uh, calls we didn't want to get. That's great. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I, I think we're almost out of time here. I'm going to ask Mike to just hit it to the last slide for us. I'd encourage those who've been watching, if they could please take the time and effort to, to do the survey. Um, as we certainly appreciate that. One last question, and, and perhaps uh, it'll be for Dr. Mamdani predominantly, because Mike, I, I assume yours was predominant for internal medicine type of patients. And, you know, with the programming, I'm wondering, does the algorithm change, do you think, um, or could it change based on patient type? Like, uh, I, I would suspect for a neurosurgical population to be quite different than that. So that would be, you know, it's almost like the dial, like is the diagnosis factor into, you know, as we get more complex algorithms. And the final second part of the question would be is, you know, you have version one is version two, version three, like is the system learning from itself, you know, um, and, and getting smarter and better um the longer you use it so um put it for that and then then we'll we'll close it up since we're at, at our limit here yeah sure so um yeah absolutely so you know we we actually have we just deployed it recently on a surgical unit and uh we took, did a lot of due diligence around we're going to retrain the algorithm we're going to do x we're going to do y because it's such a different patient group it turns out we didn't really need to modify that much it actually performed quite well in its uh, state in the internal medicine unit uh, in for surgical patients as well. Initially, we wanted um, information on surgical procedures and stuff and, and other features put in, but it turns out it didn't really add that much to prediction. So we find that the algorithm actually, I think, is reasonably good. Um, and so that that's where we're comfortable to say that we're, we're happy to deploy to other units, but we do do our due diligence to make sure that it performs reasonably well uh, in other places as well. And sorry, the other part of your question again? Is it teaching itself? Is the algorithm yeah. get tighter um, with time? Yeah, we, we didn't do that intentionally. So these algorithms can learn as time goes. The, the main issue we have is something called the feedback loop issue in that when we deploy, it's now starting to learn on altered behavior and that's gonna bias its learning. So what we'll end up doing is looking at the feedback issue over um, the next year, understanding how we're altering our behavior and then retraining the model based on that and in more informed approach to retraining. There you go. Certainly uh, 
more complex than 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 uh, what I, as a mere mortal, would understand. So thank you, gentlemen, both for for taking the time and in, in presenting on this. Um, I think the slide there tells us um, that our next one that we're planning, barring a, another emergency or crisis, is on uh, health human uh, resource strategies uh, at that ongoing challenge that I think we all experience um, in our own facilities. So I just want to say thank you to you both and also thank you to the uh, CCSO team who take the time and effort to put this on. Um, I recognize that we're going into the holiday season and, and I hope everyone gets some much needed time off in between uh, the latest and greatest crisis uh, that we're all experiencing. So thank you to everyone and uh, look forward to all of you in the new year. And uh, Mike and Mohammed, thank you both for taking the time on, on uh, what is sure surely going to be an evolving topic and, and will certainly be influencing all of our lives going forward. So thank you both and thank you everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.